All right. I know others will continue to join us as we get started, but we are going to kick things off. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our, I think, third edition of the Summer to School virtual series with You Health Jackson Children's Care. I'm your host, uh, Sierra Bragan. I'm the owner and founder of Miami Moms Blog. We're Miami's premier parenting resource, and our heart and mission is to encourage, equip, and empower local families. And so we do that through a number of resources across our platforms, as well as live events um, like this one, where we meet with experts and we talk about topics that we believe are relevant and helpful for families, especially in this time. So we're so excited and thankful um, that you've chosen to join us tonight. And we're really grateful to have Dr. Wendy Stefan with us. So um, Dr. Seven, thank you so much for, for giving us some time tonight. We're really excited. Um, I want to share a little bit more about Dr. Stefan, and she's going to get more into that as we begin. The topic tonight is so important, um, and one I think we don't think often about, uh, poison prevention, you know, what are we doing to protect our children, to keep our homes safe, and especially, especially in this time, I know I was just struck thinking, wow, I hadn't even had the thought about how much more hazard is in my home right now because we're being extra vigilant about cleaning. But so I've got a lot of personal questions myself tonight. Um, I will say guests who are watching, if at any time you have a question, you can utilize the chat function or the Q&A in the bottom, drop a question there and we will do our best to get to all of those. So at any time, feel free to drop a question. But Dr. Wendy Stefan, she is the health education coordinator at the Florida Poison Information Center. So I actually learned an interesting thing tonight the Florida Poison Information Center, which is, serves the region of South Florida. So when, you know, parents, when you call poison control, you're reaching her team in her office, and they're actually located right there, um, you know, in between Miami and the Jackson Memorial Hospital. So I love that. I love making the, the visual connection because I just always see the poison control number and think, where are those people? So it's good to know um, that we're getting a window actually into your office tonight. But Dr. Wendy Stefan, she's an educator and an epidemiologist, which um, I want her to talk a little bit more about that when we get started. But um, she works, of course, for the Florida Poison Information Center. And for the past 12 years, she has promoted the use of poison control and worked to help prevent poisonings of all kinds. So we, we think about the typical things, but also medication, household chemicals, environmental hazards, which that's definitely something that I haven't thought of and I wanna learn more about that tonight. So um, Wendy also completed her PhD in epidemiology and she has her master's in public health. Um, and she completed both of those at the U. So <laughs> we appreciate that, right? We love Miami. So um, Dr. Stefan, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We are really, really grateful to have you. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'll take every opportunity to reach families um, and people who care about caring for children, uh, even if you're not a parent yourself. So it's, it's really, it takes a village and I'm thrilled to have the opportunity. That's right. That's right. You know, I was thinking when we were preparing for this evening, exactly what you said. This is not just important information for families, but anyone who is going to be around children and ourselves included adults as well. We can be susceptible and not even think about it. I remembered, you know, being young, maybe 12 to 14 when I kind of started babysitting or helping out at the neighbor's house. And I remember the mom always left a notepad, you know, that was pre cell phone days. <laughs> so it was like, you know, here's our, our number, our car phone, and here's poison control. And I remember kind of thinking like, I don't know, I'm never, never going to need that, you know, but we just, we need to be prepared. We don't know when we will. So that's the thing. About 250 people a day do call us. And I, I can assure you, no one wakes up thinking today's the day I'm going to need poison control. Wow, <laughs> so 250 we're, we're there. a day. That was before the pandemic. So that was kind of baseline. So yeah, it's, it is, it may seem random and, and like it would never happen to you, but it's, it's quite stable and, and lots going on here every day. Right, right. I would say beginning, you know, anyone who's listening, take the time to put that number in your cell phone, on your fridge. Yeah. I mean, let's make ourselves familiar with that. So you said 250 a day. Have you seen, you know, those numbers change in light of our, the COVID situation that we're experiencing? Absolutely. And it was surprising to me, maybe I should have seen it coming, but I really, um, I, I, I didn't really anticipate the, the volume of calls that we would, we would receive 
um, linked to the pandemic. Um, so first we saw an increase in calls um, related to hand sanitizer, which makes sense, right? Um, so and that was quite early, that was back in February. So we started getting more calls. We always get some, you know, because we've been using hand sanitizer for a number of years now, um, you know, to control, you know, coughs and colds and the usual things that, that kids carry around. <laughs> um, and uh, so we've already been receiving those calls pretty routinely. And it's, you know, it's a kid will, you know, get it, lick the hand or whatever, or, right. or somebody squirts it in the eye, or they get it in a cut, and all of the things we'll see routinely. So we were getting those calls before, but we saw a big increase. So, um, you know, this year compared to last year, it was 76% more calls about hand sanitizer. 76%? <laughs> yeah, wow. so it's kind of good news, bad news, right? It means okay. people have the product, they're using it in their home, right. which we know helps with uh, infection, but the, the issue is, you know, it's it might be a little too accessible um, to, right. to young kids. So that's kind of what we've seen. So just, you know, encouraging people to, uh, you know, keep it out of reach and, and maybe even use the foam product as opposed to the liquid pump. Uh, okay. The foam product, if you have small children, particularly those little ones that are explorers who are putting things in the mouth all the time, if you have multiple children, you know who that kid is. And oh, yeah. <laughs> it's my one and a half year old. Oh, my God. give him a yeah. pump of the foam and he's like, <laughs> oh yeah, d immediately. So yeah, so like it's my youngest too. I don't know if there's mm -hmm. something about being a youngest kid. Um, right. but, but yeah, so if the foam product just contains a lot less alcohol by volume. It's still enough to kill the, you know, the bacteria on the skin, um, but it is just less overall so that if they do lick it or they do manage to pump it into their mouth, which we really don't want, um, right. they're just getting less of it. So that's a nice tip. Okay. Um, so that was the first thing we saw. And then we saw an increase right away in cleaners. Um, you know, first there was the focus on hand washing. Then there was, you know, actually there's a problem with surfaces that the coronavirus survives on surfaces. We need to be more diligent about cleaning. Um, so that was when we started seeing calls about cleaners. So the mm -hmm. calls about cleaners generally um, are up about 30% compared to last year. Um, so it's been quite a lot, particularly for disinfectant products, that's more than doubled. So people really are quite serious about the cleaning. Um, and some people are, I would say, kind of overdoing it, right? Um, right. You know, a lot of chemicals, maybe multiple products. And, um, you know, there's problems with packaging on these products in general. So let me just show you sort of one of the issues we see here. Okay, great. Yeah. So just to show you, this is what we call a poison lookalike. So if you see these two products, right, very wow. similar packaging, right? Um, right. And so we take this out when back in the days when we did health fairs, and <laughs> yeah. we would show this to parents and grandparents. So this product, um, not just to pick on Fabuloso, there are many right. products that have, you know, fruit on the label, they're colorful, mm -hmm. they're attractive. Mm -hmm. And so these cleaners, this is not a particularly toxic product, but it's obviously not one we would want anybody drinking. Right. Um, but you can see that children could, um, you know, get confused. So right. um, we've been, we've seen people also sort of cooking up almost cocktails, uh, not to drink, but to, to clean with feeling like, you know, more is better. Um, right. We've also seen people not diluting the products. Um, and that's concerning because like, for instance, Oh, can you say that one more time? I can yeah. cut out. I apologize. Sure. Said, so what now? see people who are not diluting the products at the way they should be. So they're, you okay. know, like a pine salt, you're going to use like a cap of the pine salt in a bucket of water. So, but we have people who are fearful right. and think, well, maybe a cup is going to be better in that bucket. And then you start seeing people with sensitivities. Um, and so you'll see kids with rashes or maybe their asthma is worsening because now there's just a lot of that, um, the chemical, you know, in the environment, in the residue, especially if you're cleaning frequently, and that right. residue will build up over time and it can trigger, um, you know, just sort of upper respiratory irritation in children. Wow. Um, yeah, that's something you so don't think about more. It's we not always saw, more. <laughs> I know. Well, I understand the tendency. We want to protect our children and our families. And really, at the beginning, the focus on surfaces was really alarming. There were some studies that said, you know, coronavirus can live for nine days on a surface. Wow. And it was like, oh, my gosh. Like, and so we've since learned more about the virus, and we're not right. as concerned about surface transmission. We're learning now that it's possible 
but really now the focus, of course, is person-to-person -person transmission. So that's right. good news. It means right. we can continue wiping things down, et cetera, cleaning, but we don't need to, you know, be sterilizing everything. <laughs> which is right, great. right. <laughs> it's like you mentioned earlier, it's just the, the fact that getting your hands on some of these cleaning products, like I feel like if you can buy Clorox wipes at right. Walmart or the grocery store, you've hit the lotto, know. you know. <laughs> it's a win. It's <laughs> very right. families. And you, <laughs> and you mentioned wipes, and actually um, we do recommend, we know that in terms of respiratory irritation, so if there are families where there's a child with asthma, for instance, that using a wipe product as opposed to a spray is better, right? Because there's less of that chemical circulating. And every time you pump and you spray it into the air, for kids who have those sensitivities, they're gonna, there's just more hanging around in the air as opposed to a wipe product or something that you take with a, a cloth or a sponge and, and smooth it on manually without pumping it out into the air. On contact, that's good. Good tip okay. for the wipe. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. Well, I want to um, ask you one question. We were sharing in your bio, and we've been hearing epidemiologists have been in the news a lot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we're all learning more about that. So yeah. tell me how what you do is maybe a little bit different specific to the poison control. Sure. So um, not all poison control centers have epidemiologists. So they're just lucky okay. with me. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you know, initially I had the educator role, um, but my background is epidemiology. So people do think of epidemiology as being for infectious disease, right? For viruses, of course, is the context we're hearing about it now. Um, things that, that go person to person. But there's also the field that I'm in normally under normal circumstances is actually called injury epidemiology. So okay. we study the patterns of who gets injured under what conditions, when, why, and then we use that information to inform prevention programs. Um, okay. So, you know, so, you know, who of, of all the different age groups, um, I'll ask you a question, who do you think, what age group do you think dies the most frequently from poisoning? Ooh. I want to say the little ones, maybe okay. like toddlers. So you're thinking about that, like, because that's where our focus often is. Obviously, you're, right. that's your background, your interest, and the folks that you're serving are parents of young children. Um, but right. the data shows us that most people, overwhelmingly, 90, over 90% 90 of the people who die from poisoning are grownups. My wow. Wow. So, so when you mentioned earlier, like this is actually important for you too, or for, for right. us individually, that is so much the case. So the good news is that we're doing a pretty good job of protecting children from poisoning. Um, and it's great. So like you said, people tend to know about the number, maybe in a childbirth class that they took mm -hmm. or, um, you know, uh, that, that they sought out that information. Um, so we're doing really well with protecting children. So that's really a good, uh, we know how to do it. The systems we have in place work. Um, so epidemiology helps us understand who we need to focus on. So what conditions, what products, et cetera. Wow, that's really interesting. If I may ask, you know, I don't, I don't picture like an adult eating a Clorox wipe or pumping hand sanitizer in their mouth. So oh, what are you surprised? <laughs> Like the calls are up. If we, we do crazy things right now in this quarantine. We're so spooked, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what are you seeing are like those causes for the death rates in adults? So for adult deaths, overwhelmingly, it's, it's very powerful medications. Um, okay. And so right. medications and drugs, so particularly opioids, for instance, right. you've probably heard, um, you, know, you know, medicines for pain and, and general. Right. Um, and then throw in some alcohol is often right. the scenario for adults. And so... You know, you think, oh, this is so far away when you have a toddler that this is just, you can't even imagine this becoming a problem for your child. But some of the patterns you establish when they're little are actually protective if you're really thorough for when they become teenagers. Um, right. And so it's never too early to start thinking about making sure children understand that medicine is not candy and you do not want to take medicine that you don't need. Um, those are messages you can start very early with that stick with children um, and for when they become, you know, more independent. That's right. Wow. Yeah, those medicines, it's so important to keep those things locked away. I just think recently my daughter was having some allergy issues and needed to take a Benadryl and I'm like, those little those little yellow, uh, not yellow, pink pills. And I'm like, goodness, to a kid, this just looks like a treat, you know? It absolutely does. Let me show you a display that we use, another one that we do in person. Just, um, 
and most parents have thought about this, but I think it is important to sort of see. I hope you can see this up close. Oh, wow. um, so this is my medicine or candy display. Um, and you can see I assembled this. So, um, and some of these are quite dangerous. So this little green tablet, for instance, is an iron pill. Um, you know, historically iron overdose has been a major cause of poison death in children. Wow. Um, now we see more deaths with opioids, unfortunately, because right. they're more common, but iron is one that we really want to prevent. Um, okay, I had no idea like about a, that. Like an M&M, so. Wow, 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 wow. Dr. Stefan, I'm learning so much already. Um, viewers, if you're... <laughs> I'm speaking with an expert, so rightly so. I'm learning lots. Um, those who are watching, again, if you have questions, please drop those in the comments. We did receive one question, and, and let's talk a little bit more like about the cleaning and, you know, do we need to be extra careful, obviously, when we're cleaning with our children, but people are wondering, like, would you recommend, like, making switches towards, you know, from non-toxic to more natural products where we can? I mean, in general, we recommend using as few products as possible. Um, I'm a little skeptical of some of the labeling and the marketing around natural products. Um, if you look at the labels, sometimes those products contain very similar chemicals and it's more of a marketing thing because, um, you know, really there's not a lot of regulation as to what a natural product is. Um, hmm. Some people do make their own um, types of, uh, you know, cleaners, very low, low toxicity cleaners with vinegar, you know, lemon juice, etc. You do have to be a little cautious, though, when you start throwing in things like ammonia and vinegar, like those two, you know, are going to start to be very irritating to the lungs. So even okay. a natural product has potential for, you know, people to have like rashes or sensitivities. Right. Um, so in general, if you're using the product, whatever cleaner you choose, the way it is indicated on the label and you're using it, you know, not overly regularly, you're not mm -hmm. using the higher concentrations, it should be safe because that is the, that is, there is testing required for, you know, for general, for safety for these products. Um, right. Like I said, the problem is when people get overly creative and they start combining. So for instance, um, just to mention one really common combination that we've heard about here a lot is people, especially now during coronavirus, is combining bleach with Dawn. Um, dish detergent Interesting. Um, and trying to clean and sanitize in one step. And first of all, that is not recommended by the manufacturer. So Procter and Gamble says don't do that. Um, right. And in general, you want to clean and sanitize separately. So okay. for those of you who've worked in a kitchen ever in a, in a restaurant, mm -hmm. if you had training, you know right. that you wash, rinse, and sanitize in three steps. Um, and That's it great. is extra work. I get it. Um, but if you really want to sanitize, it has to be done at a separate level. So, um, you know, that's one uh, just recommendation. And then you just use a really dilute bleach solution. Um, and generally, unless someone has like a real sensitivity or an allergy, um, they should be able to use, you know, that mild bleach solution for sanitizing. Oh, that's good. I think something that people don't think about, and I don't think about often either. And, you know, we kind of have what's the word, you know, maybe Abuela taught us like her cleaning trick or whatnot, but it's like, sometimes you don't know what these cleaning cocktails are really doing. And talk to me about the gases, because well, it's, for me, that's the thing. I'm like, ah, is this safe? It smells we like- We got a call once from a, from a, a young adult, actually. So thinking about, you know, down the road when your kids are more independent, um, this, this uh, guy, actually, this young man had gone off to college and he was cleaning his dorm room for the first time and he did what he, his mom had always taught him. Um, uh -huh. And he had combined bleach and, and a chemical, um, you know, another ammonia containing product. Um, but in their bathroom that he had grown up in, it, it was a large space. And so it, there wasn't, and then he's in this tiny dorm room and he's wow. behind them and he was just coughing and gagging. He had created a toxic gas from the combination of these chemicals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he said, you know, this is how my mom always did it. Right, right. <laughs> it turned out to not be a great, a, a great way of doing it. Um, yeah. But, you know, it had always worked for her and she had not noticed it, but he developed that sensitivity really quick. Interesting. Um, so yeah. you're right. Sometimes the things that are handed down to us um, aren't necessarily either effective or could even be potentially um, problematic, especially if you're in the smaller space without good ventilation. Um, and you're, you're starting to mix products. And bleach is very in right now. It's, um, you know, uh, just, it is, it's a really popular product. Even before mm -hmm. the coronavirus, 
Um, right. Bleach and, and Clorox type products, really people are searching them out. Um, and so you, bleach is actually in a lot of products that it, it may not even be clearly labeled. And so you might look on the label for sodium hypochlorite um, and okay. look in there. And, and because if you are going to mix products, you need to know not to mix say, bleach and ammonia or bleach and vinegar. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is good because I think so often we think, oh, well, you know, vinegar, it's a natural thing or whatever, you, you know, put it on my salad, how bad can it be? Right. No, exactly. <laughs> but it is an acid. It's acetic okay. acid. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you want to just be thoughtful. Um, and there's lots of good guidance online, you know, about natural cleaning, um, using household, um, you know, sort of staples that maybe our grandparents did use. Um, mm -hmm. But even with those, you need to be a little careful. And remember, we're so individual and our children are so individual. Um, right. There may be kids that respond poorly to just even the strong smell of the lemon juice or whatever you're using. So you may have to adjust. Um, just the same for commercial cleaning products. There may be one particular cleaner that their child has a sensitivity to and you're going to check that label and swap it out for another until you find one that, that the child seems fine with. That's good. I don't often think about our cleaning pro. I think of like, oh, my detergent. Like maybe I should change the detergent because they have a rash. Similar. But I forget. Yeah. yeah. Very similar situation. I mean, most children are, you know, so tolerant and, and don't, but, but, you know, you know your sensitive child and um, right. it's going to be that one that has the rash and, and doesn't like the smells and yeah. That's good. I think that our generation is becoming more like attentive to reading the labels yes. and checking what is actually in things. So tell us yes. again, because it's not going to say bleach as an ingredient. Like what is that, that scientific? Yeah, so, so sodium for? hypochlorite is, is okay. the most common form, but anything that starts to look like chlorine, chloride, um, those are the chemicals that you're going to look for. And manufacturers actually are very helpful. So you can call the Poison Control Center. Um, we can okay. walk you through, um, even for questions, um, you know, so you don't have to wait to make the mistake. Um, if you're considering mixing two cleaners, give us a call um, and just okay. say, you know, do these two um, chemicals interact with each other? Um, also manufacturers, I mentioned Proc Procter & Gamble, they have a hotline. You can call them up and say, right. is this recommended? And they will provide you with the manufacturer's safety data sheet if you really want to dive in um, to really uh, take a look. Because some people do notice like this particular chemical really does not agree with my child and I need to avoid it. Oh, that's good. That was my next question was like, can I call you if it's not an emergency? Yes, <laughs> if I just please. Like, okay. We're happy to receive those calls. So we do awesome. take emergency phone calls for serious poisonings, but we always have the capacity to handle questions as well. Um, so that is not a problem. Um, that is one of our really important roles is to prevent poisoning. Awesome. Such an awesome resource. Um, okay. We have a question. What about, you know, right now with the grocery stores and bringing things in, but what about specifically like our produce? Do you have something that you recommend that's safe to disinfect and clean, but not? Well, this is a good point. So remember um, at the very beginning when we were talking first about hand washing, do you remember what the, the main recommendation for hand washing was? It was soap. Right. It was okay. soap. And I think as much as we're really worried about um, viral viruses, you know, being, you know, this particular virus doesn't like soap. I mean, it literally destroys its lipid, um, you know, envelope. It will actually right. destroy it. So yeah. now, of course, you're not going to 20 minutes wash your banana or whatever. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. going to, again, be too much. Um, but really washing down produce with a very dilute bleach, uh, not bleached, but very dilute soap. Um, you know, just like even a, a drop of hand soap, a drop of, you know, ivory, just something very, very dilute, a drop in a big, in a big, you know, thing to wash. And that's actually good for food safety anyway. Now, fruit and vegetables that you're washing that you can peel, you don't have to clean, really. We're not worried about transferring the virus from handling an orange. It's just, we've never, there's no documented okay. case of that. Um, but in terms of food okay. safety, anything you're going to eat, you can rinse very with a very, very tiny, tiny, tiny bit of soap. Um, be sure you rinse really thoroughly. And then with, um, with cleaning food, um, one thing to mention that uh, is completely non-toxic and very effective is using a paper towel to dry them really firmly. So for instance, you would say okay. your apple, after you rinse, if you want to add a little, you know, tiny, tiny bit of soap, taking that paper towel and really rubbing and you're going to take off all the wax and all the gunk that kind of got in right the wax. residue and, and stuff okay exactly so paper towels really are very helpful in cleaning produce 
Um, so that's, that's a good that's tip. Instead tip. of going that extra step of using my all my sprays to pre-clean, yes, use that energy with the paper towel. Yeah. So so really, um, like I said, there's very little evidence that you know that um, the virus is surviving on boxes, uh, you know, like cereal boxes or paper. It doesn't seem to survive long on that at all. So when you bring in your groceries, what I'm doing at home bring in all my groceries, put them away, and wash my hands thoroughly. And then most of those groceries then are going to sit for a number of days before you touch them again. Right. And remember, the virus really doesn't live all that long outside of a person. That's great. Yeah. That's, oh, we're so thankful for that. That that news, when that kind of came out at first, was really... Ah, right. We have a, a lot to worry about, and that is one that does not seem to be a, a major mode of transmission. That's good. Hear that, busy mamas. <laughs> we could take one thing off our plate and like oh, exhale a little bit. Um, okay, let's we'll shift gears a little bit. Um, there's a lot of talk right now about essential oils and like what is and isn't safe for children. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? So right. So there's a lot out there. Uh, a lot of essential oils again being marketed for all sorts of things, including health conditions. Um, mm -hmm. So there is not a lot of evidence on these these issues. It's a lot of anecdotal, you know, things that work for me, kind of, um, right. and and then tremendous amount of you know the sales. So people are there's a lot of money being made on the sale of essential oils. So I am mm -hmm. skeptical of some of these because we have a whole chapter in our toxicology textbook about these essential oils because they are wow. very potent. They're very, very concentrated, right? So think of cinnamon oil, right? Um, okay. If you get that on your skin, it'll turn your skin bright red immediately. It's very irritating. Wow. If you get it in your eyes, it's very, very irritating. So think of what capsaicin is. Capsaicin is pepper, pepper spray. That is an essential oil derived from a pepper. Wow. So these okay. are strong, um, you know, people find them soothing and, you know, diffused into the air, and there's probably no problem with that. The concern is when people start ingesting them, putting them directly on the skin. Um, and then there's one thing that, um, that is quite kind of concerning. Um, lavender oil, for instance, if you put too much in your back, um, there have been documented case studies of boys who, um, who develop what's called gynecomastia. Um, so lavender oil is a phytoestrogen. <laughs> okay. So it's like an estrogenic hormone. And so what you wow. see is basically if you use a really high concentration in a boy that you can start seeing hormonal effects. Wow. So I think, you know, generally speaking, we were actually going to have a whole session on uh, essential oils at our, our national conference this year, but alas, no national conference. Um, so mostly we're looking at, we're worried about rashes, you know, these oils getting into the eyes. We don't want them on our delicate tissues and our mouths and our and noses where they're irritating. But there are some that really we would worry about being ingested or being covered over large portions of the body. But if people have questions, again, they can call the poison control center, say mm -hmm. this is the particular oil I'm, I'm concerned about, or this is what my child just got into. What do I have to think about here? And mostly it'll be low toxicity, not much of a, a big deal. But I would be a little skeptical of some of the claims because there is right. no FDA approval or testing for efficacy mm -hmm. or even safety in some cases for these products. And they're very popular right now. So that's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. Interesting. It's a good reminder that marketing works. Yes, <laughs> so we have to do our facts check, fact checking. Yeah. Especially when it's marketed as natural and a great alternative to, you know, scary chemicals. Oh, you know, there are chemicals right. and essential oils. That's what they are. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, that's just as a reminder, you know, any sort of product, whether it's, you know, in our Clorox squirt bottle or something we create at home, it's worth, yeah, speaking to an expert. And I love, instead of Googling who's the yeah. safe, my combo, I can call the poison yeah. control line and, and get an actual expert who can help me yeah, out. Yeah, and just a perspective, you know, and in terms of it may be just a question of just using a tiny amount in, instead of a ton, you know, um, so something very simple. That's great. Well, thank you, those that are listening. If you're just joining us, um, we're super excited to have Dr. Wendy Stefan with us, um, speaking about poison prevention and with our families, with ourselves in the season of extra cleaning with COVID-19. So great questions that you guys are bringing. Feel free to keep those coming in the comments. Okay, I have a few more. Um, you know, we talked about, you're seeing, I think you said like 70 plus percent more volume of calls uh, related to the, the poison issues. What are you seeing aside from, we've talked a good bit about the cleaning products, but aside from that, 
what are you seeing like with children, I guess related with children where children are being harmed or? Well, there's a potential. So the other thing people are doing in addition to cleaning really, you know, trying to be really thorough with cleaning is that people are thinking about how do I support my immune system? How do I protect myself from infection this mm -hmm. other way? Um, right. And so what we have seen also is an increase in calls about um, dietary supplements um, and vitamins, um, particularly yeah. vi uh, multivitamins, et cetera. So, um, you know, the vitamin calls are up over 50%. So we received this year so far over a thousand calls about, about vitamins. Um, and so again, kind of some caution here. <laughs> Remember when I showed my right. showing candy display, one of those in there was a dummy bear vitamin. Uh, many products are now marketed as dummies for adults and for children. Again, back to marketing. Um, and so we do get calls where a child has eaten a whole bottle of, you know, these, um, you know, a vitamin product and ha is having, you know, mostly diarrhea, stomach upset, even vomiting. Um, and over time, if children are eating, you know, if you do eat a lot of these, they can have systemic system, uh, symptoms um, that look sort of fluey, for instance. Um, so we right, want families right. to call if somebody gets in and, and helps themselves to a whole bottle of vitamins. Um, generally, if there's not iron in that vitamin, that child will mostly have those stomach upset type issues. Okay. Um, so vitamin C has been a particular one that we've seen people taking a lot of what we would call a mega dose in some cases. Um, you okay. know, they're fearful of infection. They've um, you know, they've, they've read or they've been told that vitamin C is protective. So they're, you know, maybe taking a little too much or somebody's taking somebody else's, for instance. Um, vitamin C can have some side effects. So again, stomach upset, diarrhea, and, you know, these are things that people don't realize they may be giving themselves from mm. just overdoing it with the vitamins. I also wanted to mention niacin. So that's a type of B vitamin. If okay. you take too much or if, you, if you're sensitive to it, you can get what's called a niacin flush. It feels like a hot flash. Okay. Um, so if you started a new vitamin regimen and suddenly you're having what feels like a hot flash, that is a classic um, symptom of what's called niacin flush. So those okay. are just two examples of, you know, vitamin effects from vitamins that people really don't expect. They're not looking for them. Um, so vitamins are not, again, more is better. Um, we do know that it can be helpful for children who are picky eaters, right? Right. So if you have a picky eater, you have a child who is absolutely not going to, you know, uh, you know, eat vegetables or doesn't want to drink milk or whatever. So supplements can assist in that area. But if your child's diet is basically healthy, um, you know, you don't really need to go whole hog on the vitamins and dietary supplements. Um, so far, we really don't have a lot of evidence that these are helpful with the exception of some vitamin D and zinc, those two in moderate doses have do seem to be helpful, um, particularly for people where there's a deficiency, right? Okay. And so okay. you always want to ask your pediatrician, you know, is it possible that we have a deficiency, you know, if a child, for instance, refuses to drink milk of any type, you right. may have a vitamin D deficiency, and then that would be super helpful for that child to have a supplement. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, you don't think about supplements. And I have to say, I have to confess, I, um, have, you know, take a prenatal vitamin and I have the, the gummy kind mm -hmm. and the top broke off. So I like put them all in a Ziploc bag. I keep them up high, but I pulled it out, you know, to take one one day. And my daughter was like, oh, mommy, what can, you know, and I thought, oh my goodness, like, of course yes. this looks like candy to her, yes. you know. Oh, and the Ziploc bag. Oh boy. Uh, yes. Right. <laughs> we actually participated in a study last year with CDC with five other poison centers. And when we were asking parents that they were, you know, when they were getting into kids were getting into medicine, sort of how, what was the situation where the child got into that stuff? And it was right. really remarkable how many of them, we thought, well, maybe the, the, those child resistant packaging, maybe right. that packaging is not good enough. Maybe we need right. to improve these packaging. But it was actually much more like you described where someone, a parent for convenience and in a, in right. a moment of hecticness and, you know, just being distracted as we all are now had actually right. removed it from the packaging. So we couldn't really blame the packaging. It was just more that, that families were moving the medication around. Maybe it was in a pill minder, maybe they were traveling and right. the child just came upon it. Um, so so not blame <laughs> at the point. No, but that's so good. That's challenging. Cause I'm thinking even about calling and they feel bad or embarrassed or whatever. You mm -hmm. will not shock us. We're not here yeah. to judge. We're here right. to help. 
Right. Well, yeah, this is, this is challenging for me because I'm like, okay, I need another, because then even just the thought of like, if something were to happen and I needed to call and say, they ingested 40 prenatal vitamins. I can't even tell you like what was in it because right. I don't have the packaging. That's the other issue. That's, so we always say, please keep your medicines and chemicals in their original containers. When you start yeah. swapping things around into different containers, I have another display. If I have, if I can show you. Yeah, please, so, please. So this came from a real case. This wasn't a medicine, actually. This was actually um, a, another product, a liquid. So you can see that um, both of these are Gatorade bottles, right? So one right. of these is the original Gatorade that came in the packaging, um, but the other one is actually antifreeze for the car. It's oh my goodness. For the car engine. Wow. Okay. So you talk about switching products, just the way you can put those, those tablets in the Ziploc, people also will, will do this right. with chemicals. Um, and so this one here, the green, is the watermelon flavored Gatorade, but this one is I was I would have chosen the other one. <laughs> right? Because of blue wow. raspberry, et cetera. Um, That's right. So this came from a true case. And so we always say, please, please wow. leave whatever your, your product is in the original container, because just like you said with the, the vitamins, you don't have the ingredient list. In a situation like this, instead of really being able to offer immediate help based on facts, we're going to have to say, right. send them into the hospital because we're going to yeah. have to watch that child wow. um, for, um, uh, you know, for symptoms. We're going to have to kind of piece it together like a mystery. <laughs> right. No, that's good. Mm, yeah. Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, we've had a couple moms who've asked about, can kids be poisoned by ingesting too much melatonin? I know some moms use melatonin to help sleep. Talk to us about yeah. that. Okay, actually, I'm so glad you mentioned it because it is one of these cases. Um, we, as an epidemiologist, I track really closely trends in our data. So we look at three month trends. So of course, COVID is, has been the three month trend, um, but also three year trends. And melatonin is one we are getting more and more calls about. Um, that being said, it's really as a function of what you've seen is that parents are using it, adults are also using it a lot too. Um, in general, melatonin is tolerated very well. It's one of the very, you know, a safer product. It is naturally occurring in our bodies, actually. Um, so the, the only issues that I've seen with it, and there are a few contraindications with medications. So you want to make sure that you've cleared whatever the product you're taking is with the medicines your child or you um, are taking, just to be 100%. And I don't want to list those here because they're right. very specific. Um, but for adults, the other issue is not combining melatonin with alcohol. Right. So those yeah. are the ones that spring to mind. Um, but you know the combinations, as with any supplement, just because it's natural, you don't want to just forget about the possibility of drug interactions. So mm -hmm. that's something also you can ask at poison control or you can talk to your pediatrician and say, you know, I'm thinking about this supplement. My child, you know, is having trouble sleeping. You know, we've all been having trouble sleeping with all the stress. Mm -hmm. um, but just to clarify, like, and to be sure you're, you're letting them know, because like I said, with the niacin flush, sometimes there are symptoms that people are having and they don't even connect that symptom with that supplement. You go back so to the doctor supplement. can help yeah. you put those pieces together, but mm -hmm. help poison control. Wow, that's great. Yeah, it makes you think like all those things that I've, you know, maybe that random rash that I didn't know or whatever. It's like, well, how is that possibly yeah, related? I've lost you. Oh no. Can you oh, there me? you are. You're back. Okay. okay. <laughs> all of a sudden it was quiet. Okay. No, go and you're back made this point a couple times and I want to a little bit touch on it but you were talking about it in the, with cleaning but then also of course with medication or even just a natural supplement but adding alcohol and I think the common misconception is like we hear that warning and we think yeah we shouldn't mix alcohol because alcohol might make me inebriated where I'm not conscious but it's not that it's like it's the chemical reaction correct it really is it can enhance and it works differently with different substances i'll just share my own experience here I, this is what i do for a living i mean i have a right. lot of knowledge um and i've made this mistake so i took a pretty strong allergy medicine um mm -hmm. in the morning um and i forget exactly whether it was a Sudafed or something but it was a fairly potent like a 24-hour allergy medicine right um that evening you know, all those hours later, I had right. a single glass of wine at dinner. Hmm. I was 
really powerfully affected. I am not much of a drinker, so I really a glass of wine is all I have in general, but I felt it. Um, Luckily, my husband was driving. We had gone out to a restaurant. You know, this was a while ago. Um, Right. And I was having trouble forming sentences. Wow. Wow. So it doesn't have to be a lot of alcohol. It doesn't have to be that you are drunk, but there are certain medications where the combinations are dangerous. So right. think about right. this as an adult, like for driving, for instance, mm-hmm. you do not want to be combining these, getting in a car with your children in the car and right. scared. And right. I, I just think people underestimate, like I've been asked, like, what do you think the scary po- scariest poison is? And they yeah. expect it's going to be something exotic. And I have to say it's alcohol. Yeah, <laughs> it right. It changes our judgment. That's right. That's <laughs> yeah, right. It doesn't, just, it doesn't just intoxicate you. It actually can affect your ability to make the decision. So. Yeah. Well, no, that's good. I I think that's worth noting. Um, Okay, we're going to move on to a a couple of other topics, but we did have one question, and I love, you just said this. You said, don't ever feel bad or embarrassed for calling poison control if you have a question or concern. Um, You know, one of our viewers said they felt bad when their son got into a bathtub that was full of bleach-based tub cleaner, and they forgot forgot to clean it out. But they wondered, and I don't know if the child ingested it or maybe just got in it, but like, is that something they should have called the poison control center yes. for. anytime something weird happens like that a child yeah. eats something strange even if it's a thing like we have yeah. um you know stories where children um ingest i'm going to show you another thing um you know little magnets this oh a yeah magnet toy so whether it's a magnet a battery um you know child gets something splashed in the eyes anything that's weird that you think i wonder if this is toxic a great time to ask us um and just a reminder too you're speaking to when you call you're not speaking to just a volunteer or um someone who's received some training you're speaking to a doctor nurse or pharmacist by law oh wow and at our center everyone who answers the phone has an md so wow. they're all doctors and they do nothing but treat poisoning a lot of them are also parents Okay, so expect, you know, understanding and compassion and these services are confidential, which is critically Mm -hmm. important because um, we are HIPAA compliant. If you're familiar with HIPAA laws in terms of privacy, we are not allowed to share uh, information with other groups, um, except for, say, a doctor treating the case, like we would collaborate with the emergency medical staff in the hospital if a child needed that, for instance. Wow, education just even on the resources out there is so important because I think I, I'll be honest, I've had the thought that like, oh, I'm gonna get some, you know, volunteer and then if it's bad enough they'll send me you know, but it's like you're really speaking to a professional. Yeah. We're the That's same people that resource. the ED physicians call. Um, so wow. we'll see, I'll hear the, the doctors and they're on one minute with, you know, in Spanish with, you know, abuelita, and then the next call mm-hmm. is actually an ER physician and they're using all medical terminology. So um, please take advantage of this expertise. Yes, that's great. Okay, I want to talk about two different things um, and start where you like, but carbon monoxide mm-hmm. in kids poisoning and how to, you know, and then also insect repellent because hello, summer. <laughs> and- <laughs> summer in Florida. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So what is the connection with the carbon monoxide in summer? Um, and the answer is hurricane season. Um, okay. Now, God forbid that we would deal with a hurricane on top of this. Really, I prefer one ma- major crisis at a time. Thank you very much. Um, right, exactly. Possible, we're, right? we're out for hurricane season this year. Yeah, we're not, just, we're not playing yeah, that we're game. Just taking, yeah, we're taking it off. Um, so, but we do have to think about it, and we do see an increase in carbon monoxide poisonings after storms, and that tends to be when okay. people's power is out, um, and they're using their portable gasoline-powered generators. Generators. Okay. Very convenient, right? You can literally walk, stroll right into Home Depot if you can find one, um, stroll right back out, um, plug it in, fire it up, and power your home. Um, And unfortunately, a lot of people sort of have a vague idea of carbon monoxide gas. Oh, you can't see it, you can't smell it, but they don't really connect it with how to avoid these fatal poisonings. And when people die from carbon monoxide, it's the whole family, and the people who die first are the children because they're smaller. Um, They have a higher respiratory rate, they're breathing faster, they're getting a higher dose of it, 
Um, and what it's doing essentially is making it impossible for their blood to carry oxygen. It's basically um, just blocking up. So the blood is circulating, but oxygen is not traveling around the body and it's not getting to the brain. Okay. Wow. So by the time people feel symptoms, it is often too late. Too late. So wow. um, when people operate a generator, um, we want to make sure they have a long cord and they have it 20 feet from the house. Okay. 20 feet really far yeah which is so hard in miami possibly it is it is actually impossible in some settings depending right. on the size of your lot where right. your house is where your neighbor's house is set up right we yeah. have had people kill their neighbors with their generators so <sighs> think of the safety of your family but also your neighbors so There's 20 a- feet from an occupied residence um, because of the, 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 the exhaust that it's pushing out, it, it, it puts out a lot of exhaust. Um, right. And so you need that long cord, 20 feet, and you also mm-hmm. desperately need the carbon monoxide detector in your home. Yes. Yeah. So if your home is new, uh, built after, I believe, 2012, it will be there by code. It will be required to be combined with your smoke detectors right. and your set. Uh, the way you'll know is it'll have a CO on the detector. CO okay. is the chemical symbol. It's one carbon atom, one oxygen atom, and that's the symbol. So you'll look for CO if you have it, your set. Now, if your home is old, like mine, my house is, was built in 1924, so uh-huh. we've renovated it, but yep. it's an old house. Awesome. Um, so, or if you're renting, for instance, an older home, right. maybe you won't know if you have that detector. Um, you can buy them, Home Depot, it's pretty easy. My favorite is the one that plugs right into a plug. You don't have oh, to wire cool. it. You can buy the kind that literally just plugs into the wall. Well, so if you're moving frequently or you're a renter, you can just pack it up and move it with all of your belongings. Um, and it will sound an alarm if that carbon monoxide is coming either from that generator or from an attached garage. That's the other situation right. where a car is left running. Those are the most common scenarios. Right. Oh, that's that's one. That's the one I think of. I didn't think about the generator because I'm like busy moms. We know we yes. get in that car, we crank, and we're like, oh, let me yes. run inside real quick. I'm gonna and, run back, and the phone rings, yeah. and the car is running. Yeah. So we see that also if you have a fancy car with an automatic ignition in the fog. Right? Okay. That there's a button right. that starts the car on the keychain. Um, what we've seen is that people bump it and start the car. They'll have it in a pocket and and the the cars are very quiet now, so the car will just start running. So if you have an attached garage, um, you know, absolutely a a carbon monoxide detector will be um, very, very important um, and and we can prevent those tragedies. So most recently after Irma in Miami-Dade, we had three deaths and over Mm. 100 hospitalizations. Um, So even Irma, yeah, Irma, which really, frankly, hit the keys. It didn't really hit us to the same extent, but people went straight to the generators when the power went down, and we saw the we saw the, the deaths. Those were all adult deaths, um, but you know, this is something as a parent you would never want to experience. Exactly, that's great. Okay, talk to us about um, insect repellent that we use on ourselves and our kids. What are yes. kind of common safety concerns with bugs? So I, in general, do not like insect repellent as a parent. I don't like how it smells, it's icky, whatever. That being said, in our community right now, we have two mosquito-borne diseases that are being spread actively. Uh, Dengue uh, fever and West Nile uh, virus is also Mm -hmm. spreading. And this is, you know, unfortunately, it's not someone who's traveled and come back from another place. Yeah. It's being spread through the mosquitoes in our community. Wow, so, I kind of think that we have Zika behind us, so we don't really have right. an issue. There's always something new, unfortunately. Yeah. So yes, so now it's dengue and and West Nile. So in general, you always want to control mosquitoes around your property by getting rid of standing water, etc. That's super important. But right. using the repellent is actually really necessary. Um, so in terms of safety, we do know there are options about the chemical that you might want to use. So the most famous and well-known and effective is called DEET, D-E-E-T, right? right? And you want to use one with a lower concentration on children. Um, and those okay. will usually say something like family safe. So that's going to be like a 15%, as low as 7% com- com- concentration okay. of DEET. That's going to give you some effectiveness. You want to avoid the ones that are like 30%, like oh, the wow. deep woods. You know, right. <laughs> so Put like, a drop on your hat and it covers everything. 
Yeah. Those are for people who are going to be in the wilderness. For that's right. You, you don't need that. Um, okay. So that's one. If you're, if you have a sensitivity or you're concerned about DEET, there's Picard and there's a few other um, chemicals and you can look at consumer reports actually has a really nice breakdown of options and effectiveness. Um, okay. You know, there are products that people, I know people mention sometimes skin so soft, effectiveness, you know, citronella, also not super right. effective. So if you're going to put a chemical on you, you want some bang for your buck. Um, it's so going to work. Yeah. I would check that. Yeah. Okay. Um, but controlling where they're breeding is the most effective and the least toxic way to do it. Mosquitoes only go about 200 yards from where okay. they hatched. So if you have a lot of mosquitoes, they are hatching somewhere. They're hatching close. somewhere. Yeah. They're not coming from miles away. There's some, there's a, a way, a place that they are reproducing close. Um, okay. So, and then just to make a distinction between insect repellent and pesticide. Okay. Insect repellent, you're spraying this on and it confuses their ability to find you essentially. That's what it is. It's not killing the mosquitoes. And sometimes okay. people will use actual pesticides on themselves Ooh. thinking that that's gonna do the job or it'll be better or something. Right. Those are not safe for your skin. You don't want to be spraying yourself with, um, you know, permethrins and some of these chemicals that do penetrate the skin pretty effectively um, and are, are really not safe. So for the people who are going to use those super strong chemicals, you know, if you're a biologist in the wilderness or whatever, they might put right. a little on their clothing, not on their skin. Okay. So be sure you're, the product you're looking at is a repellent, um, okay. not a Repel, pesticide. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is so good. Things that we think we know so much about, you know, but it's knowing these little specific tweaks is very helpful. Um, okay, I'm looking at the time and we've got about maybe five, six more minutes. So if you're watching and you have a specific question, go ahead, throw those up now and we'll do our best to get to them. I have just a few more. Um, talk to me about, and we spoke a little bit about this, but like, are there some types of poisonings that parents like could sometimes miss? And not know. I know we talked about supplements, maybe a rash or sensitivity, but anything in particular? Well, the, the, the frustrating thing is that people, um, parents in general, will underestimate the potential seriousness of a medicine mistake. Um, mm. We think of medication as being good for us, right? It helps right. us. It's something that is good and um, beneficial. But actually, most of the fatalities that I mentioned this early, uh, earlier from, yeah. from poisoning these days are the result of, of pain medication, for instance, um, illicit drugs as well, but you know, heroin and these types of things. But really, it can be a single blood pressure tablet, a single medication tablet for diabetes. These um. are very powerful. These are extended release medicines that will are supposed to control, you know, an adult health problem for a whole day. Um, and they're right. very potent and children are small, so they get a bigger dose. So if you and I right. took a tablet and a child took a tablet, the child gets the bigger dose. And I think people don't recognize, they think, well, it's fine for me. It can't really hurt her. They might look at the child and say, she seems fine. You know, of course she right. does because that, that tablet is sugar coated. It goes down easy, but mm -hmm. in four hours, her blood pressure or her blood sugar may collapse. She might mm -hmm. go into a coma. And if she's asleep, mm -hmm. you don't even know. Um, right. And so we don't want people to underestimate the importance of medicine safety. Um, yeah. So one of the resources we're sharing with you today uh, at the end is going to be a website called Up and Away. Okay. Um, and that is from the CDC. And it talks about the importance of securing medicine in the home. Um, and so certainly we want to get rid of all your old medicine. A lot of people are stockpiling medication. They have mm -hmm. bins and bags and medicines that are years old and are potentially dangerous. Um, yeah. So one of the things we say as people are getting ready for new babies, <laughs> take this opportunity to clean out the house because you're going to be so busy when they, the baby comes that, mm -hmm. that you may not have the time to really get rid of all the nasty old chemicals and medications that are no longer needed in the home. Clear everything out and then start fresh, right? Mm -hmm. And really, really only keep what you, what you need. I also recommend a lockbox. Um, for medication okay. that is potentially dangerous. So that's going to be the medicines for pain, blood pressure, blood sugar, um, you know, uh, hormone seizures, medication for depression and anxiety. Those all belong in a lockbox. Um, mm -hmm. You can start really young, right? When your children are small, it's a little inconvenient, but it's a good practice for as your children turn into teenagers and they may have friends who are looking for a medicine that has a right. sweet value or oh. can be abused. 
So right. start putting some good uh, practices in, in place when your kids are little and you'll have safe routines. That's good. Begin with the end in mind. That I love that. Just, yeah, it's not just about the here and now, but what are our children learning? Yeah, getting ahead of it. Yeah. Right. That's great. That's great. Okay, um, how about we'll close out with this. I want to know, um, and I, like I said, I've learned so much just about this amazing resource that's available to us to call if I just have a question about my household cleaners. But at what point... Um, you know, do I think, oh, should I call poison control or should I send my child to the ER? Like, how do I kind of make that decision? Yeah, so a big part of what we do is triage. So that's a fancy medical term for deciding where a person should be seen. Okay. Um, and so let us help make that decision for you. So if a child has swallowed the wrong medication, if a child has been bitten or stung by a bug spider, we didn't really get to environmental hazards, but we also yeah. help with venomous bites and stings. Okay. Um, and so, you know, you've got the jellyfish sting, you've got, you know, a child seems unusually sleepy, you're wondering whether they got into something, um, you know, the child sprayed the chemical in the eye, etc. Those are all scenarios that a poison control call, you know, that's going to be 15 seconds, we'll walk you through what to do. Now, right. where we would recommend 911 is if you come across a child who is already unconscious. Okay, okay, yeah. So and this, right. this happens sometimes, you know, the parent comes in, we've had grandparent come in and they see that the child drank the bottle of cough syrup, it's empty and the child is down. In mm -hmm. a situation like that, they can't wake the child. They do not want to call poison control at that moment. What we need is rescue. So right. we will call rescue and then rescue will call us and say, we're en route. What do we need to be looking for? What should we be? Is there an antidote that we need to, to provide for the family? Um, and there are many wonderful antidotes that they do actually carry on the ambulance. So okay. uh, we don't want parents throwing the kid in the car and actually taking the child to the hospital. If the child has been poisoned, we want you to call rescue because they have a lot of, they can start treatment on site in a lot of cases. So, you know, I know the instinct is to just get the child there as fast as possible. But remember, there's care on the vehicle um, for some basic stuff opioids, okay. for instance, there's, they'll have naloxone, it will block that poisoning instantly. Um, wow. it's, it's wonderful. So you want to get them en route um, for that. So yeah, if a child is already unconscious, if a child has chest pain or anyone has chest pain, um, again, you want, you want to call 911. Um, you know, if there's a lot of bleeding, which we don't typically see with poisonings, but that would be another circumstance um, where just go straight to 911 and they'll bring us in if there's a poison piece to what's happening. Okay. That's good. No, that's so helpful. Yeah. Oh, Dr. We're Stop. free. <laughs> <laughs> we're free and, and we don't care if you have health insurance. We don't care about people's immigration status. If you have a working right. phone, no matter what language you speak, we have our doctors who speak Spanish, of course, um, but also right. Creole. And if you speak amazing. another language, people will actually bring on an interpreter for you. Oh, that's amazing. That's so great. Tell us the number so that everyone can put so, it in their phone right now exactly. if you don't already have it there. Yeah, so it's 1-800-222-1111. <laughs> one 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 you want to make sure you get the number right because if you miss dial, it's a sex hotline. You don't want that. So 1-800-222-1222. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's wow, yeah. because I misdialed. So, you know, that's live and learn. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Not be another that webinar. <laughs> <laughs> this was great. I have to okay. say, I, honestly, I, I'll be so honest. I came in excited, but feeling a little bit like I kind of know all there is to know exactly. about. <sighs> yeah. Oh no, I'm, I'm learning every day. I feel like, like there's always a new product on the market, a new medicine, a new drug interaction. And now the, and now COVID, my gosh, I had to really brush up on so many things, um, you know, and I'm learning every day. So let us share that expertise with you. Uh, you don't have to figure it out yourself. I know people are trying to Google their way out of everything now. Um, and we can save you so much time and stress and really money because about more than 80% of the calls we get where with somebody is like, you know, I think my child's been poisoned. If we can treat you at home wow. and actually reassure you, because often it's non-toxic. It's going to yeah. be like the kid ate the kitty litter or ate the yeah. burn or whatever. <laughs> and those things, you know, ew, weird, icky, not dangerous. But you know? non-toxic. Yeah. Non-toxic. So that's a huge relief. Um, and let us, let us help you with that. Yes. Um, and especially now when our health system is, is potentially overburdened, 
It's more that's important right. than ever not to rush to the ED for things that really don't need to be there because that's, that's where right. people are uplifting. That's good. And I know a lot of, a lot of families are like, Ugh, about even making themselves susceptible to having to go, you know, right. to a hospital or ER right. or whatnot. So this and is the responsible way to avoid that ED visit. Um, and if it is something important, you will know, we will tell you, you need to go. And then you'll tell them when you arrive, poison control, you know, either you'll tell the EMTs on the ambulance, or when you arrive in the ED, poison control told us we needed to be here and they will consult with us. So, um, you know, you won't be wasting your time that will be, um, you know, walking you through and walking them through the process of treatment. Oh, that's great. Uh, and on that note, these webinars, they have all been so helpful. So if, if you're listening um, and if you've missed previous webinars, you can access all of those at jacksonevents.org. We did have a great one about burn and swim safety and some information from the Children's Trust as well as, um, you know, COVID and summer camp. So just so many great resources. So access those jacksonevents.org and go ahead and mark your calendars because in two weeks, so bi-weekly, in two weeks on the 23rd, we are going to be um, meeting again and we're going to be talking about the topic of exactly what you're saying. When do I know if I need to go to urgent care or I need to just hit the, hit the door to an ER, you know, because um, as parents, it's kind of, oh, especially in this season, we want to make, you know, the wisest decision for our families and children. So take a look at these resources, screenshot those if you're watching so you can check them out later. Um, to Wendy, too, before we finish up, too, if you want to yeah. keep up with um, sort of, like I said, there's always something new with poison control, new products, yes. new trends, you know, that we're seeing. Um, we are on Facebook at Florida's Poison Control Centers, and we're also on Twitter at, at Florida Poison. Um, and so, like, for instance, right now we have something up about wild mushroom poisonings. We've seen mm. more than double this year. It's been very wet, and we've been outside a lot. That's um, right. So, you know, that's really how you'll keep up with poison-related uh, issues specifically. That's right. Great. So helpful. Yes. Yeah, so Twitter and Facebook. Um, also, if Miami Moms Blog can be a resource for any of you uh, families out there, you can find us on all the social channels at Miami Moms Blog and MiamiMomsBlog.com. Dr. Stefan, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you and your expertise. And everybody stay safe out there and don't ever feel shame or embarrassment for calling the Poison Control Hotline because oh, no. it truly really can save your life or your children's. So we appreciate this great resource. Thank you everyone for joining us and um, we hope to see you in two weeks. Thanks so much. Good night awesome. everyone. Thank you everyone.